My name is Martin Kleppmann. Um, you might know me from this book that I published about a year ago called Designing Data Intensive Applications. Uh, this book is not about CRDTs. Instead, it's a very broad overview of the architecture of large-scale data systems and the problems of distributed systems. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a, a different area. So uh, I am a researcher at the University of Cambridge, except today, actually, I am formally on strike. Um, <laughs> you, might have, you might have gathered, uh, I mean this seriously, there's, there's a dispute going on at the moment at many UK universities where the powers that be want to essentially cut back our pension schemes in a very radical and unjustified way. Uh, which amounts to a massive pay cut and really is not justified. So as part of this, I, I am on strike. I'm still going to give the talk to you uh, because uh, we have no problems with QCon. It's our university that we have a problem with. Um, but just to say that I am giving this talk as a private individual who happens to be interested in distributed systems <laughs> rather than as an employee of the University of Cambridge. OK, so let's talk about some technical stuff. So what I'd like to talk about is collaborative applications. And so a classic example of this would be Google Docs. So there, as you know, you can have several people who can all collaborate in a document. They can edit the document at the same time without having to email it back and forth, which is very convenient. Now, what we want in this kind of systems is that eventually, like even though several people might be editing the document at the same time, they should all end up with the same document on their screen at the end. So this is what we call a convergence property. Everyone should end up, as they communicate, having the same state. So if you were here this morning, Heidi Howard gave a great talk on consensus, which is also about getting several nodes in a distributed system to agree on something. And so it looks like superficially the problem that we have here is kind of similar to consensus. So as we'll explain later in this talk, actually, this is a very different kind of problem. Even though it looks superficially similar, the properties that it has are fundamentally different. And comparing those two will be an interesting part of this talk. OK, so let's take a scenario that is probably familiar to you. This is you, a little blue stick figure, who is hacking on some code on your laptop. And you make some changes, you edit some source files, you save them to your local disk. At some point, you decide you're ready to share this code with your colleagues, and so you commit it to your favorite version control system, and then you maybe push it to a centralized repository, maybe to GitHub or something like that, some mechanism by which you can send your commits to your coworkers. And so at the same time, while you've been editing the code, maybe your colleague, who is this pink stick figure, um, has also been editing the code, has also been changing it, maybe also making commits, and what you end up now with is that uh, if this colleague wants to also push their changes to the server, they will first have to fetch the, the commit that you pushed and have to merge those together. And so, as you've probably experienced before, this kind of merge is straightforward if you were editing two different files, because in that case, Git just knows, well, two different files, I'm just going to merge them together. Those changes are independent. If one of you changed the top of a file and the other one changed the bottom of the same file, then that's probably still fine as well because the changes are far enough in the part, a part in the file that Git just says, OK, I'll, I'll merge those automatically. But if you were editing actually the same lines, then you've got a merge conflict that you need to resolve manually. So if we look at this kind of system more abstractly, you can say there are a couple of nodes. These might be like your laptop and your phone, or they might be servers in a data center. We don't really care too much. They're just some kind of computing nodes, each of which can store some data. And when you want to edit that data, you make a change to your local copy, which might, like in the case of the source code, is the source code files living on your local hard disk. You change that, and then at some point, those changes get communicated to anyone else who also has a copy of that data, so to any other nodes. And so while this is going on, maybe a purple user can simultaneously be making some change to their copy of the data, and they similarly will then forward on those changes to the other users. And so whether these, uh, these changes here are like via git push, via this kind of explicit operation, or if you're using Google Docs, these kind of changes are sent automatically, continuously in the background. So in the case of Google Docs, this uh, the local copy that you apply the changes to is living in memory in your web browser. So in the tab that you've opened the, the Google Doc in, when you type a letter and you change the document, 
that change gets immediately applied to your local copy of the document. So it doesn't wait for a round trip to the server before showing the letter that you just typed on your own screen, because that would take too long. So what Google Docs does in that case is it immediately applies the change locally, and then asynchronously in the background, which might take a few seconds or whatever, it sends on the, the change to the server, who then sends on the change to anyone else who's got a copy of that document open. And so you kind of get the same kind of property that several people can make changes independently without knowing about each other's changes, just like you get with Git's, uh, Git commits, just on a shorter time scale. But you still have exactly the same concurrency issue. In particular, this uh, concurrency issue becomes more obvious if you have offline editing. So in this case, you can think of this as a network partition that is separating one of the nodes from the rest of the system. And so the pink user might still be changing the local copy, their local copy of the document, but they can't send the changes to any of the other users because they are offline right now. They don't have an internet connection um, or because there's some network disruption. And so in that case, the changes will stay local to their own machine. And then only sometime later, once the network is restored, those changes will then be flushed. But what we still want in that case is for those changes to be merged together. So taking this type of type of Google Docs again as an example, you can, let's take the state of the thing that, is, that we're working on as a text document. So this is like just a sequence of characters which currently read hello. And so you have two users who concurrently update this document. The pink user adds the, wor the word world before the exclamation mark. And the blue user adds a smiley face after the exclamation mark. And so now, if this was Git, this would probably be a merge conflict that you would have to resolve manually. But if you've tried this kind of thing in Google Docs, it turns out that actually Google Docs never prompts you to, to resolve a merge conflict. It will always just merge the changes automatically based on what it thinks is a sensible way of merging this. And in this case, we can actually define quite a sensible way of merging it because we can say, well, the world clearly came before the exclamation mark. The smiley face came after the exclamation mark. So we can just preserve both of those insertions. And so a final, a sensible final merged state is hello world exclamation mark smiley. And this is in fact what, what Google Docs will do. But we're not limited to only text documents. So let's look at a different data type. You could use a set, for example. So a set is just some unordered collection of elements. And you could have the red user maybe removes the item B from the set. So it was previously AB, removes B, so only A is left. And concurrently, while that is happening, the purple user decides to add a new element, C, to the set, written here with that set union operator. So the set then is merged ABC. So as those two changes get uh, propagated from one node to the other, again, we can set, just define what we consider to be a sensible merged outcome. And in this case, I'm going to say, well, A was not touched by either user, so we're just going to leave A there. B was removed by one of the users. C was added by one of the users. So we want in the final state to contain C, but not B. And so we just say A and C is a, a sensible merged outcome in this case. One more example. I uh, consider a counter. So maybe like the number of likes on a Facebook post or something like that would be a counter that you can increment. And so here, let's say we're starting in the initial state where the counter value is one. And you have two users who both increment that counter. So they both change the value from one to two. Now you could say that, well, both users are in the same state. So we should just continue, we should just consider two to be the merged final state. But that would actually lose information because here we know from inspecting the, chain, the set of changes that happened that actually two increment operations happened. So really what we want is for both increment operations to still take effect in the final result. So what we want is that the final result is actually three because we started in one and then one user incremented it, the other user incremented it. The order in which you do those two increments doesn't matter, but the final value should be three. So what this is saying is that we need to consider not just the state, the, the value at any one time, because if we just compare two and two, they look the same, but actually we need to capture the sequence of changes that were made to the data and reapply those, and that will allow us to reach a sensible merged outcome. Okay, so 
This problem of people editing stuff simultaneously and having to merge it has been studied for a rather long time. And there are, at a high level, two families of algorithms that were developed. One is operational transformation, which has been studied by academics since the late 80s, and which is actually the foundation of Google Docs. So Google Docs internally uses an operational transformation algorithm. Um, However, due to some problems that I'll explain in a minute, people got rather frustrated with operational transformation in the early 2000s and then started this separate direction of research called conflict-free replicated data types, or CRDTs for short. And this is, uh, CRDTs has been the focus of our research. So let me just give you a bit of historical background because it's kind of interesting uh, and also some motivation for why we wanted CRDTs. So, as I mentioned, a whole bunch of people across research community have proposed operational transformation algorithms. So the first ones in, in the late 80s. And you know the paper reads quite nicely and it kind of makes sense and looks plausible when you read it. Except you then realize, reading some more papers, that actually a few years after this was published, people discovered that this application was that this algorithm was simply wrong. So what I mean with wrong is what these algorithms are supposed to achieve is convergence. That is, everybody ends up with the same document on their screen at the end if no more edits are happening. However, this algorithm did not achieve convergence. It actually, there were certain edge cases uh, where certain edits could happen concurrently where you would end up permanently diverged. So these two different copies would be permanently out of sync with each other and never become consistent again. So that is kind of a problem. So, of course, people thought about this a bit harder and proposed another algorithm. Unfortunately, a few years later, that one also turned out to be wrong. It had a very similar bug. And this story just kept continuing. So over the course of about two decades, all of these algorithms were proposed and then only a few, later, few years later to discover that it's wrong. So a real bloodbath of failed algorithms here. Um, we did end up with a couple of algorithms which are correct, and in fact, Google Docs is based on one of those that is not wrong. Um, but the particular property of those remaining ones is that they require a centralized server. So they restrict the communication flows in the system so that if the pink user here changes something and the purple user has changed something, the changes they make have to be exchanged via this central server. So it's not allowed for them to have some kind of back channel or some kind of other communication paths on the side, because if they had that, they would break the assumptions of the algorithm and that it would no longer achieve this convergence. So this is a severe restriction here. All of the communication has to go via Google server, even if it's just like syncing some data between your phone and your laptop, and they're like 50 centimeters away from each other, you still have to go via a data center in Virginia or whatever, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. So what I'm interested in is generalizing this model so that actually you can just have any communication topology in the system. So for example, if the blue user here has two devices, a phone and a laptop, and they want to synchronize some data, and the pink user also has two devices, well, they, they should just be able to synchronize via local network or whatever uh, connectivity they happen to have, even if they're actually not connected to the internet right now. So this uh, kind of communication pattern is, simply won't work in the Google Docs case because you cannot safely have this communication directly between devices without going through the central server. So I think it's, it would be really great if applications can not depend on this central server, be more decentralized, so that you can actually just use whatever network is available. And then at some point later, if connectivity is reestablished, then of course the nodes should be able to synchronize again using the internet. So this is a more kind of decentralized pattern for building applications. And when I talk about decentralization, people inevitably ask, oh, is that something to do with blockchains? Because because a lot of people in the blockchain community who are uh, interested in building these, these uh, systems without trust in a central server um, also label their, their work under the heading of decentralization. So I'm, I'm personally not all that interested in blockchains. I'm happy for other people to work on it. Um, but let me just compare the two briefly because it is such a frequently asked question. So as you probably know, a blockchain it consists of some blocks of data. Each subsequent block contains a hash of the previous block, a cryptographic hash. 
And that means then if you have a signature on the last block, you can follow through the hashes and you're guaranteed the integrity of this entire sequence of blocks. And then there might be some Merkley trees and stuff like that, which allow you to cryptographically prove that a certain record appears in this chain. And so that's like the, the foundation for Bitcoin transactions and such like. Moreover, what you have in most of these blockchain protocols is some kind of consensus protocol, which decides what the next block in the chain is going to be. Uh, and typically those are Byzantine consensus protocols, which just means that they can tolerate some of the nodes actually being actively malicious. And still, so despite the presence of malicious nodes, uh, this thing will agree on the next block. So this agreement property is quite strong that you get in blockchains. So in particular, what the protocol is supposed to guarantee is if there are no forks, you have this linear sequence of blocks. It's a totally ordered sequence. And uh, there's this decision process which ensures that no conflicting transactions get put into the same block. So what this means is uh, if you're wanting to prevent the, a user from spending the same coin twice, you have to make a decision as to whether this transaction or that transaction that they made using the same coin is the valid one. So what you need here is consensus, which if there are several conflicting proposed transactions, it picks one. And that is what prevents double spending in these cryptocurrencies. So that is the fundamental abstraction of consensus. There are several proposed values potentially conflicting. And what the consensus protocol does is to decide on one of them and to throw away the others. And that is exactly what you want in the case of a blockchain. And it's exactly what you don't want in the case of collaborating on a document. Because if you think about it, if you make some changes to a document and your colleague makes some changes to the document, what a consensus protocol would do is to choose to choose the changes from one of you and throw the other one away, which is actually, it would probably make you a bit unhappy. So what we want here for collaboration protocols is to keep all of the changes that were made and to merge them in such a way that they converge towards the same state. So that is what I mean with this thing looks superficially like consensus and is really different because consensus is fundamentally around this idea of choosing one. Okay, so back to these two families of algorithms for achieving convergence. I'm going to talk briefly about some research that we did on CRDTs. So CRDTs are also a family of uh, data structures which several people on different nodes can update concurrently and which will automatically merge the changes together, very much like those examples I showed earlier in this talk. And they've been used in a few practical systems. So for example, the Atom text editor just recently released a, a collaboration feature that is built on CRDTs. Um, the React database used them internally for merging things and so on. So given this uh, poor history of problems with operational transformation algorithms, what we wanted to do is to be really sure that we're not repeating the same problems with CRDTs. So we want to prove formally, mathematically, that these CRDTs really do converge, that they really do behave um, as they're supposed to. Because as we saw with the problems with the OT algorithms, some of these algorithms can be quite subtle. And just like thinking <sighs> about it informally, you might not be able to fully convince yourself that it really, under all circumstances, does converge. So what we did is we used Isabel, which is a theorem proving software, um, uh, which you can use to write down formally the properties that we want, that you want. And so we used this software to write down uh, several CRDT algorithms. So RGA is a, is a text editing CRDT, Opset is a, a set, and the counter is like what I showed earlier. And we can show that they uh, satisfy a consistency property called strong eventual consistency, which in particular implies convergence. And so we can show that these data types satisfy this consistency property under certain assumptions. But now how do we know that those assumptions are valid? We now have a second layer of proof in which we have a model of a network. And it's a very unreliable network. It's allowed to throw away any number of messages, reorder messages. And what we prove here is that those assumptions under which this strong eventual consistency holds are satisfied in all possible executions of this network model. So no matter how badly the network tries to mess things up, we can prove that these algorithms will always satisfy the guarantees they claim. So unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this theoretical work in any more detail. 
If you're interested, uh, there's a URL there at the bottom of the paper. It's reasonably readable, even if you don't have prior experience in formal verification of algorithms. Uh, so do have a look at that. What I do want to spend a bit more time talking about is AutoMerge, which is an application, uh, an implementation of these ideas that we've been working on. This is an open source library in JavaScript. In principle, you could implement it in any language, but I guess JavaScript is uh, very portable across many platforms, which is why we're using that at the moment. And you can think of this as a data model layer or a data structure library on top of which you can build collaborative applications. So what it gives you is a abstraction that looks very much like JSON, and you can modify this JSON document and use that to build applications on top of it. So I'll show you some examples of prototype applications that we built using this. Uh, the first one is called Trellis. It's a, a clone of Trello, the, the popular project management tool. It looks like this. So just like Trello, uh, you have columns and you have cards in those columns, and you can drag and drop the cards between columns. Uh, this here is a, a superhero recruiting initiative that we've used as an example. And uh, you can assign columns to people, and you can leave comments on cars and so on, all, all the typical stuff you would expect. The cool thing with this is that it's implemented without any servers at all. So we are able to do this based on a peer-to-peer -peer networking model using WebRTC, which is normally what enables like video calls in your web browser, but you can use it for transferring data as well. In particular, we can transfer the edits made to a CRDT over something like WebRTC, and there's a bit of user interface here on the right-hand side for managing that network. And moreover, what it does, it keeps track of all of the changes that happened. Uh, so whenever you move a card around or you update a card or whatever, it actually appears in this log of changes here in the, on the bottom right-hand side. So that's just one example app that we built on top of AutoMerge. Another example is uh, an app we call Pixel Pusher which is quite a fun one. It's a uh, collaborative pixel art editor. So like pixel art is kind of sort of retro gaming aesthetic um, where you try to make uh, pictures consisting from just this grid of a fairly small number of pixels. And people like make really cute animations and stuff like that with this. Uh, so we took this off the shelf uh, open source implementation by, by Javier Valen, I think is his name. And uh, this was just a, a single user app running in your web browser, and we made it, uh, turned it into a collaborative app by building on top of AutoMerge. So it looks like this, uh, Pixel Pusher is our variant, and what we wanted to experiment with this here is not just like the straightforward collaboration where one user makes a change, it shows up on another user's device, but also wanted to think about like, for example, with Git you get pull requests which is a mechanism by which a user can suggest some changes and then the maintainer of a repository can accept or not accept, or maybe accept with some changes. Or with Google Docs, there's this feature for suggesting changes and making comments. And so we wanted to explore a bit like, what would a similar kind of suggesting changes like user interface look like for a collaborative pixel art editor? So then the Top right hand side, there's this bit of user interface where you can actually see there are several different versions of the document. So the base document contains just the eyeballs, but then there's one variant that is like a, a potato man, and uh, so another variant, and you can switch back and forth between those variants. Uh, any user can create their own copy, and then a, another user, if they like it, can merge that into their local, kind of like a pull request, but just with a very lightweight user interface. So, these kind of things are enabled simply by keeping track of the history of all of the changes that are done. And that is what AutoMerge does internally. <clears throat> so as I said, AutoMerge is this kind of data structure abstraction on top of which you can build applications. Uh, AutoMerge does not itself have a networking layer. So it's just a piece of JavaScript that runs in one process. It doesn't prescribe a way how that communicates with copies of the document running on other devices. So we've now also been experimenting with different network layers that you can plug underneath AutoMerge. So as I mentioned earlier, Trellis is built on top of WebRTC, peer-to-peer -peer communication, using a library that we called MPL. Uh, the Pixel Pusher, Pixel Art Editor, is actually built on a different networking layer because we were just experimenting with different layers. This one taken from the DAT project, so they are about peer-to-peer -peer synchronization of data sets. It's a, a really interesting project. So we were able to build on top of that 
uh, using their log abstraction, which actually worked really nicely as well. So that's a library we called Hypermerge, which makes the connection between hypercore and automerge. Uh, but if you like, you can just send the uh, updates via a server, via WebSockets, or whatever you like, really. So automerge doesn't prescribe any particular network protocol for using here. So let's look a bit more at the kinds of data structures you can use to build these collaborative applications. So as I said, automerge gives you this kind of JSON-like abstraction, and you can use JSON to implement, for example, a to-do list. So a to-do list consists of some fairly simple structures. So in particular, JSON has two ways of combining things together. One is a list, which is just an, like an ordered sequence of things, and one and the other is maps. And so maps are just like a, a dictionary that maps a, a key to some value. And the value can be, again, a map, or it could be a nested sequence. So you can nest these lists and maps inside each other arbitrarily. And when you have this structure now, you can modify it in several ways. So for example, you can change a value that appears somewhere. So overwrite one primitive with another. So setting an, an item as done, like clicking the checkbox that this item is done, would just uh, trigger this flag here, probably. Another thing you might do is uh, edit a string that appears in here. Or you might insert a new item into a list between some existing items. Uh, or you might like insert a new key into a map, or you might remove things from this, of course. So you can do any sorts of editing operations on this data structure. And uh, in AutoMerge, it looks like this. So this is uh, some example JavaScript code of how you do this in AutoMerge. Uh, so AutoMerge uses an immutable state object. That is, this uh, state here is the current state of your data. And that is never modified in place. Instead, if you want to change it, you call this automerge.change function. You pass in the current state, and you get back a new object, which is a new state in which that new item has been reflected. So it's very much like immutable.js. Uh, if you've used that kind of thing, it's a very similar way of thinking. Except what we wanted to try here is to keep a sort of familiar imperative programming model. And so what we have here is you pass in this. Uh, oh, one thing you do is you can provide a, a kind of like a commit message, we call it, which is just arbitrary string. It's not interpreted, but it uh, is stored alongside the editing history. And so if you want to see what changes happened, it's kind of nice to provide that sort of human readable explanation of the change. And then there's this callback here where we have this document object which is mutable just within the period of this callback. And any changes that you make within here are intercepted in JavaScript using a proxy object. So here, for example, this todos.push. Push is the JavaScript uh, method for appending a new item to an array. So it's here using the doc.todos doc as an array, appending this new item uh, to the end of it. And so these are just kind of standard JavaScript methods. You can use assignment or whatever you like as well. And automerge captures any of those changes and internally stores it as a log of operations. So you don't normally have to deal with this operation log. I'm just explaining it to you so you have a bit of an idea of what's going on under the hood. Um, so internally, this, this one command here of adding a, a new to-do item gets broken down into these lots of little micro operations. So what we do is we, we create a, a new empty map object, then we set the title, uh, key of that map object, we set the done key of that map object, then we insert a place, create a new placeholder position in a list, which is where we want to insert that to-do item, and then we link that object we created into the list. So fortunately, you don't have to ever write these kind of operations yourself. That would get extremely tedious. But this is just for an idea of what's going on internally. And now, automerge simply remembers all of these operations forever. And so, this does use some storage, but our basic thinking there is that, well, Git, if you have a Git repository and you don't do a shallow clone, actually the repository contains all of the commits that ever happened in that repository. And so if Git can keep all history forever, then so can we. And if we need to do compaction things in the future, we'll, we'll solve that in the future. But for now, we're just storing everything. And it's working surprisingly well, actually. And keeping all of the uh, operations forever has some really nice properties, like we can do time travel. So, uh, which sounds amazing, it's actually really simple, um, because we have all of the changes that happened, we can look at past states of the document, and so you can just ask for the history, and it'll just give you a list of states that the document went through since the begin beginning of time. 
and uh, it'll keep the commit message that you attach to, to any changes there, this human readable, like add the to-do item, and give you a snapshot of what the document was at that point in time. And so AutoMerge is able to do this efficiently by just selecting the subset of operations at any given moment and figuring out from those operations what the document looked like at that time. Okay, so we're talking about collaboration, so let's talk about some concurrent changes because that's where the conflict resolution comes in. So let's say that our uh, starting point is two users both have this to-do list con containing a single item, which is watering the plants, and it is not yet done. And so two users now concurrently update this to-do list, like maybe like one of them is me and the other one is my wife, and we're sharing this to-do list between our two phones. So for example, maybe I add uh, buying the milk, which is done false, and my wife says, oh, she's watered the plants now, so she marks that item as done. And so these are two independent changes that happen maybe while the devices are offline. So now we want to merge them together. And so firstly, we immediately apply any change to your local copy of the data. Of course, that's what we want, because even if you don't have an internet connection, you should still be able to update the data, obviously. But then at some point later, the network comes back and we're able to communicate these changes from one device to the other. And so at that point, then auto merge will figure out that, well, there are changes to two different objects. We can merge these two together cleanly. So setting done to true for the watering the plants gets applied to the left copy and inserting the new item of buying milk with done false on the right hand side, they both get applied. And so in this case, the, the merge is quite straightforward, and what auto-merge guarantees you, this is the fundamental property of CRDTs, is convergence. And that is more formally defined if any two devices, any two nodes, have seen the same set of updates or the same set of operations, even if they might have seen those operations in a different order, as soon as, soon as they've seen the same set of operations, then their state of the document will also be the same. This is a really nice property to have because it means we're not depending on like who saw which operation in which order. We just have this simple property that once the data has been exchanged, everyone's in the same state. Now, there are some edge cases in which there are conflicts that are not neatly resolvable. And this is really the only one actually that we can't sensibly resolve automatically, which is the same field or the same item in the list gets overwritten with two different values. And so like, that's fundamentally the, the most basic type of conflict. And in this case, you know, it's not really defined. Is it better to buy soy milk or better to buy almond milk? You know, that could be a uh, subject of debate. And AutoMerge is not opinionated on whether soy or almond milk is better. So what AutoMerge does is, firstly, it picks one of them arbitrarily, but deterministically, as the default value. And so if you just like, look at the document, uh, without inspecting the conflicts, it'll just pick one of the two. That's about the best we can do. But it keeps the other one in this side object here called underscore conflicts, and it will tell you, hey, you know there was a conflict for the field title, and this other node, node ID 1234, set the value to buy almond milk. So even though we've got here buying soy milk as the default value, there's also this other one. And so then it's up to the user interface. Do you want to show like both conflicting values and let the user choose one? You can implement that kind of manual conflict resolution if you need to. But this is actually, this assignment to the same field is the only case in which that manual conflict resolution has to happen. So if it's text editing, for example, let's say we've got a document that says, hey guys, and we may want to make it more gender neutral, so maybe one user changes guys to everyone, the other user concurrently changes guys to folks. And so you could say, like, how do we handle this kind of conflict? And uh, what AutoMerge does for this is, in fact, the same as what Google Docs would do in the same situation, which is it thinks, well, OK, guys was deleted on both replicas. So deleted twice is the same as deleted once. So guys is gone. Everyone was inserted on the left-hand side. Folks was inserted on the right-hand side. If two things were inserted, we're just going to keep both of them. And we're just going to put them in an arbitrary order. But we're going to make sure that the order is the same on all of the replicas. So ensure that everyone sees either, hey, everyone folks, or hey, folks, everyone. Either of those is a valid merged outcome, um, but which of the two gets chosen is non-deterministic. Uh, sorry, it's, it's 
random but deterministic. It's ba chosen based on the unique identifiers of the nodes. So um, like this is fundamentally the, the properties you get. Um, you might think it's not ideal. Maybe you do want more manual conflict resolution. Uh, the basis on which we are going here is that actually like Google Docs does this and millions of people use Google Docs. So it seems to be fine in many cases. Um, maybe what we'd want is kind of like an advisory conflict uh, uh, like notion that says that maybe if some edits occurred within like 20 characters of each other or whatever defines some kind of threshold that we show a little note to the user saying, by the way, there were some edits close together here. You might want to check if the merged outcome is like a valid English sentence or not. We can't figure that out. But um, I think that's about as much conflict resolution as you might need here. So I'd like to show you just briefly uh, before we wrap up here how the algorithm behind this works, because I think it's kind of neat. And so although you don't need to implement this kind of algorithm yourself, it's kind of cool to see what happens here. So let's take as example a document consisting of the letters H, E, L, and O. And we have two concurrent edits happening to this document. So one user adds a second L to make it re read hello. And the, user, the other user, the purple user on the right, adds an exclamation mark at the end. So the way the CRDT works is it gives each character in the document a unique identifier, and it has a particular scheme for creating those identifiers. Um, and that is, it consists of a number, which is just like a counter, and the A and B here is the name of the node that created this particular list element. So node A on the left uh, creates new list elements with A, and node B here creates a new, ele new list element for B. So using the name, node name B. And so because each uh, node increments the counter for every operation is generated and two different nodes will have different names, so that makes these identifiers unique across all of the nodes. And so now uh, when, uh, when these nodes exchange data, might be via a server or any kind of network, doesn't really matter, what they exchange is these operations which say insert a new list element, new character L, with ID 4A, so that's the new, the new ID given to this new element, after the existing list element with ID 2A. So this is important. It doesn't say, like, insert at position 15, because position 15 might change if somebody inserts or deletes something before position 15. <coughs> so instead, we use these identifiers as a way of reliably pointing to a particular position in this sequence. And uh, the other user similarly creates this operation that says insert exclamation mark with ID 4B after the existing element 3A, which is the O. And so these messages simply get forwarded on to the two uh, users, and they each apply exactly what, what you would expect. So the purple one here looks for the character with ID 3A and puts the exclamation mark with 4B after the 3A. So it doesn't matter that the position has shifted along by one. This uh, unique identifier still clearly identifies the position to in, where to insert. And we just need, this doesn't rely on any ordering guarantees particularly, so this can just go through any kind of network. So you might realize that I haven't told you about one of the issues, which is what happens if two people insert in the same place, in the same document. And so this one requires a little bit more explanation. So imagine we have a document that reads ABC, and uh, on the left-hand side, a user adds x, y between the a and the b. So it reads a, x, y, b, c. And independently of that, on the purple side, uh, the letters p and q get added similarly between a and b. And so what we want to ensure is that still here in this case, everybody ends up <laughs> in the same state at the end. OK, and so for this, I'm now going to start with sending that, uh, that insertion of P over from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. This works as you would expect. So insert P with ID 4B after 1A. 1A is still there. There's the letter A. So it puts the P directly after A, but before the X. And then similarly, the Q comes across. Insert Q with ID 5B after 4B. So 4B is there, but that's the letter P that we just inserted. So it puts the Q after the P. OK. So that's one direction sorted. We've got A, P, Q, X, Y, B, C. Now we need to ensure that if the messages go in the opposite direction, we end up in the same state. 
And if we just do this naively, so just applying, say, insert 4a after 1a, it's actually going to end up with this in the, in the opposite order on the right-hand side. So here we need to be a little bit more clever. So we need to ensure that the x ends up after the q. So even though the, the operation for inserting x says insert after 1a, what we need to do is actually shift along and put it not directly after 1a, but after 5b, which is the q. And so for that, we're going to use the following rule. When a new insertion comes in, so in this case, the insertion of 4a comes in after 1a. First of all, we search for our starting position, which is 1a, so we want to insert after 1a. And now we're going to compare the ID of the new incoming operation to the ID of the next element in the list. And in this case, so the next element is, the, is 4b, so it's the, the p. And so what we're going to do now is if the ID of the incoming operation is less than the ID of the next element in the list, we're going to skip over that element and move on, so move one further to the right. And we'll repeat the same thing. So now we look at the next, next element in the list, which is q. q has an ID of 5b. 5b is also greater than 4a, so we're going to skip over it as well. So apply the same rule. Skip over any of the elements that have a greater ID than the one we're inserting. And so then we've skipped over Q. Now the next, next element to look at is the letter B, which has an ID of 2A. 2A is less than 4A, so now we stop the skipping, and this is where we insert the letter X. And so this rule, it does actually work. It takes a little bit of convincing, and this is why we did all of that formal proof stuff, because it's not entirely obvious immediately that this actually does the right thing. But it turns out that it does actually always do the right thing. And now finally, for the insertion of y, this one is easy again, because here now we have just insert y with id 5a after id 4a. 4a is that x that we've already placed in the list, so now we can just put it directly after the x. Just to show you that the skipping doesn't happen in any other circumstances, so this 5a is not going to skip over 2a, because 2a is less than 5a. On the other side here, this insertion of p, 4b, will not skip over the x here, because 4b is greater than 4a, so 4b will not skip over 4a. OK, so this whole thing is just an example of how the CRDTs work. If you want to play around with this stuff, AutoMerge is open source and liberally licensed, and it would be really great if anyone wants to try and just prototype some applications on top of it. I'll tell you, this is research code. It's not production ready. We're not pretending that it's perfect in all circumstances. But it does seem to be working reasonably well. Uh, we were able to build some non-trivial applications on top of it. So maybe you will be able to as well. Um, thanks to especially the Hypercore from the DAP project, which we used for the networking in our last work. Um, if you're interested in the formal verification, there's a link to the paper. Um, this, is, this work is based on our earlier work on a JSON CRDT, which is this penultimate paper here on the list, except the algorithm we use in AutoMerge is actually a bit different from what is in the paper. So we need to write an updated version of that with the latest algorithm, but we haven't got around to that yet, I'm afraid. But there is a, a, like a, a markdown page on the AutoMerge repository telling you about the internals, if you're interested in that. Uh, and finally, uh, this book, which, as I said, is not about CRDTs, but might also be interesting to anyone. Thank you very much.